So today I'm answering a question from a viewer named Insane Brain 213 He goes on to say, yo, E, I've got to get rid of some generational baggage, he says. He says there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of guilt, blames his parents. But then he goes on and says something interesting. He says, I know Jesus will take the load, but what does that mean? So there's a lot to unpack here. Before I get into your actual question about what does Jesus taking the load mean, I want to address the fear and shame aspect because it's bioenergetic, meaning that it's a feeling. When you experience fear, it's something that's literally happening in your body. And the way we sort of resolve any emotional disturbance at the physical level or bioenergetically is by confronting the actual sensation. What does fear actually feel like in your body? And then working bioenergetically in order to, well, confront and then resolve that. Now that's beyond the scope of my intention for this video, but I have an entire series on bioenergetics that's unfolding as we speak. And if you're a subscriber to this channel, you'll learn all about that great stuff. But uh, as you've been learning in the previous uh, lessons I've been doing, we're a spectrum. Right? A lot of people think that, well, we're just a physical body. Well, you're just a body, you're just a mechanism. There's just synapses going on and off in your head and that's how you are a human. And then there are those who uh, negate the body completely and are you know, all spiritual. We're spiritual and the body is nothing. Well, both are completely wrong. We are, we are within that spectrum. And so when dealing with the human person, we got to look at it from that broad spectrum. And so today I'm going to, as I have been recently, I'm going to go really high. I'm going to go, I'm going to get into the aspect of spirit, right? Um, but also acknowledge that this can and should be dealt with physically as well. In fact, I think we can get a lot more done at the root system, which is physically um, early on in anything that we're trying to change, resolve, right? So anyway, but so that question, what does it mean to give it to Jesus, right? Or that Jesus saves you or that Jesus changed my life. Uh, a lot of confusion, something that was kind of confusing to me as well too. And still very confusing when some people say that. I think we have a spectrum there also, right? On the far left end of the spectrum, you have people who say, all you have to do is repeat these magic words. Jesus Christ, I believe in you, right? And like, bang, your life is going to change and you sh don't have to do anything. You just have to believe, right? And there are those on that in that camp that even believe that if you try to do anything, you're trying to win that. You really just need to let Jesus do it. And uh, I've seen this in many people's lives where it's like, well, you, okay, now you called yourself a Christian and so you believe in Jesus, but nothing has changed. You still think, act, behave, and do the things that you did before. And you got a bunch of people telling you, don't do anything, just read the Bible, that's all. Just read it and you're going to be changed. Um, it, I, it's impractical. It doesn't make any sense, actually. Um, some people, by the grace of God, got a spontaneous quantum leap in, in evolution, and that is completely out of their hands. And I think if you're waiting for that to happen, or if you're expecting that to happen, um, just because you repeat some magic words, you're, you're going you're gonna to struggle because nobody compels the grace of God. If he wants that for you, he's going to give that to you. And he's going to give you whatever he wants, whatever he feels like it, but you got to be open to it. And so there's some merit there. There is some merit there because if you're not if you're not open, you're not available, you don't have faith, well, then you can't let anything in because they're closed, right? Uh, a lot more to it, but I want to move on. So you got those people on that end of the spectrum that are like, just say these magic words and you're going to be changed. And then you got those on the other far end of the spectrum where it's, if you're not doing, following all of these rules and performing all of these rituals uh, and these, these elaborate prayers, then there's no hope for you, <laughs> right? And so that end of the spectrum makes change, makes growth, makes grace very inaccessible for a lot of people. You got to be initiated into this. And well, this one, it makes it very cheap, right? Cheap and then inaccessible. Whoa, way too broad. 
Uh, and, and of course, both have their benefits because on this end of the spectrum, there's some responsibility, there's some rigor, there's some uh, engagement that's required, right? And so that's helpful, that's really helpful. In fact, I tend to think that this far left liberal side of Christianity has caused a lot of harm as well as good because it made Jesus accessible to a lot of people. Um, but at the same time, it's like, well, now you've cheapened everything and made it very weak and flaccid. And so you got a lot of like limp wristed sissy boy Christians because I don't need to do anything. And Jesus loves me even if I'm blah, 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 whatever. Right. It's like, ah, eek. But then you got this end of the spectrum, too. And um, it's very helpful in that. Because this pervades in our society, in every way, shape, or form, everything's easy and accessible, this end of the spectrum, uh, I think, is making a comeback, but we can't, we can't allow it to dictate our whole way of thinking. But as men in particular, we want rigor, we want discipline, we want things to do. Like, give me a prayer rule, give me a rule of life, give me hard prayers to memorize, give me consistency, right? You see what I'm saying? So there's a lot that is, is at least even for me, uh, has been very, you know, I'm drawn more towards this end of the spectrum. Traditional Catholicism, orthodoxy, some of the more traditional branches of uh, Protestantism, but these are more rigor. Uh, there's a lot of people that are, it's, it seems, moving towards religions that want that require, right? Require something from you. And Christianity absolutely requires something from you. But anyway, so broad spectrum, answer your question. Well, what does that mean? How do you how do you how do you, how do you allow Jesus to take the wheel, right? In a way that's practical and makes sense and actually brings you through the purgative, illuminative, unitive ways, meaning you're spiritually evolving and getting closer to God. Great benefit on both. Both are extreme. Somewhere in the middle, you've heard people say, and of course, this can be misconstrued also. A lot of religious jargon gets people confused, right? Uh, and I can understand why a lot of people are turned off by religion because they hear jargon, but they don't see, they don't see results. So I've heard a lot of people say, relationship. You need to have a relationship with Christ. You hear a lot of the people on this side of the spectrum saying that, and it's a lot of emotional stuff like, oh, you need to, you know, you'll see a lot of them like waving their hands to like Christian rock music and crying. And it's like, well, if that's what you mean by relationship, then I don't want anything to do with it. It seems very emotional and weak and soft. A lot of, those, a lot of guys are very soft that way. Right? And then, so the relationship is perverted. And then of course, on this end of the spectrum too, there's like holy, there's fear, but it's like, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a relationship, it's, it's a slavish. A lot of people have re referred to more right-leaning Christianity to slavish. Who said that? I think Nietzsche, right? But in the middle here somewhere, and what I think is really the core of what we're after, right? Beyond all theological debate, right? What are we really after? And it is relationship, it is relationship. And my friend, I know you mentioned having challenges with your parents. Challenges with our earthly fathers deteriorate our relationship with God the Father. And that's a part of why the family has been attacked to such a great degree in, in recent generations, particularly in the West. The family's attacked because if you remove the father, you destroy the home, you destroy the image of God. The family is the image of God and the father being the head of the family is... Christ of the home. This is all biblical. So by removing the father, but by de destroying the family, you destroy the image of God in the hearts of the children. And that's why so many people hate God or don't want anything to do with religion and Christianity in particular. So with, with, the, with the current situation that we find ourselves in, what do we do? Right? So, first of all, recognize that the way you relate to God the Father, in most instances, is going to be associated with the way that you relate to your Father. And all of our fathers are fallen. All of our fathers are fallen men. And if you are not forgiving 
of your father for his mistakes, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespasses against us. You're going to have a hard time, but there's a bridge. There's a gateway. There is a, there's a conduit to the father through a perfect example, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, when, I, when I'm talking about Jesus Christ, I'm talking about the logos. I'm talking about the perfect man, the perfect man, like flawless man. Wilhelm Reich, because I've been doing a lot more studying into bioenergetics, and Wilhelm Reich was an atheist. He was a pure scientist, and he just wanted to know, you know, he started studying like psychology, character structure, sexual energy, and then he went far into orgone anyway. Um, Wilhelm Reich came full circle later in his age and began to appreciate Christ because he said that Christ was the fully orgastic man. And that sounds crazy. But Wilhelm Reich believed that to be fully, to be the fully free, perfect human, you had to release, you had to be free of all neurotic holding patterns and what he called orgone energy, right, life force energy, uh, was moving freely through the body. I'm not trying to prove that orgone is true, but there's frequency, there's, there, there's spirit, right? It's like these guys are trying to figure out what ultimately becomes spirit, right? And so uh, he, he asserted that Jesus Christ was like the perfect man, like physically perfect, right? God, could, God it was reflected in him absolutely perfectly. Perfect, right? Thus, we say Christ is God. In the Bible, it says that Christ lives in me. It, it, no, he, I no longer live, but it's he that lives in me, Paul says, I believe in Corinthians. So that means that you can have a relationship with the Father who's totally inapproachable, as we've spoken about before, but through your friend, Christ, your mentor, Christ, your perfect image, the perfect image of, of God incarnate that is available to you in Christ. Follow me? How do you have a relationship with Christ? Christ is not inaccessible. Christ became, God became man so that he could make himself more accessible to us. Where is Christ now? People will say, well, you know, he's, well, he's dead. He died on the cross. But Christ's resurrection is important for today because he resurrects in us. We die and rise with Christ. Christ, Christ resurrects in us. Again, this is all very abstract. I know it sounds crazy. And a lot of people probably turn this video off at this point because like, yo, Elliot, you sound like a, you know, like religious jargon. But I don't take things for face value. I'm more, I'm so interested in what's actually practical and what works and what's helpful that I got to go deeper. And sometimes I take things on faith, but then allow it to be worked out. And what I'm going to share with you right now, I think is the working out of that faith so that it's actually practical and so that you get real change, not just magic words and not slavish rigor. Relationship. What does that look like? Cool. So I'm going to introduce you to mental prayer. Mental prayer. Mental prayer is prayer that happens in your imagination. You have vocal prayer, which is words that we repeat, either rote words like, you know, repeating the, our father, right? That's a, that's a, that's a vocal prayer. Uh, and then we also have on the other end of the spectrum, um, well, within that same category, there's vocal prayer, but they're your words. So a lot of, a lot of Protestants will just make up their own prayers, which is fine. It's cool. But that becomes rote too, because if you notice, they keep repeating the same words over and over again. There really is no depth to it. So it becomes a rote prayer and they're, and they're verbal prayers. There's nothing wrong with those. Those are good prayers. Those are good to do. They're helpful because they, they engage the body, right? You're speaking them out loud, vocal prayers, vocal prayer. But mental prayer is an internal phenomenon. And it had been referred to by the church for the longest time as meditation. It really is what Christians meant by meditation. There's lots of good little books on Christian meditation that I would invite you to just check out if you want to. 
But it's not, this is not a Zen Buddhist Eastern only sort of thing, although today it may seem that way for various different reasons. I think because a part of it, Christians have lost the, their traditions and because of the influx of Eastern traditions. And we could talk about the history of that and why, but that's neither here nor there. But Christians have given away a lot of stuff that have been then just also usurped by the new age, like picked up, you know, we've, we've a lot of it happened after the, Re the Protestant revolt, but I'm not blaming. There was a lot of things that were ushered off as like, oh, that's mere mysticism. And they use that term mysticism as if it was something negative. No, oh, that's mysticism. Get rid of that stuff. We don't, we don't need anything but the Bible. And then the new age, you know, and I'm thinking like, you know, Madame Blavatsky and like, you know, Crowley and like a lot of these like bad people, <laughs> they came right in, they swooped up right in and was like, hey, well, we got something for you. And there's a, there's a mystical hunger. There's a religious hunger in the heart. And if you just give people a book and it's like, just read this thing and just say these magic words and you'll be okay. They feel cheated. There is a cheating. And that's why there's so many people that are attracted to Eastern religions and new age, because it's like, it, there seems to be some more depth there, right? Don't be fooled. OG traditional Christianity is mystical at its core and meditation and meditative at its roots. So when I'm talking about mental prayer, I'm using a term that has been adopted because of the perversion of the term meditation, but it's meditation, it's Christian meditation. I'm gonna show you how. I'm gonna to talk to you all about that here. That's the point of this video so that you can go to Christ in relationship and have a conversation that's useful. It's very useful. So uh, another, a few other terms that are associated with mental prayer would be uh, imaginative prayer. And this term comes from uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola. St. Ignatius of Loyola. So the things I'm making up, I'm saying here, I'm not making up. I'm not making these things up. These have come from tradi the tradition of the church, right? It's not just Eliot picking up, mixing some new age with Christianity. That's not it. This is the mystical tradition of the church that has been hidden or, or, or thrown away. So St. Ignatius of Loyola, if you want to do some research on him, he's, he's got a whole retreat that he used to, that he taught that were, it was called spiritual exercises. And the whole thing is based off imaginative prayer. And he has a whole system for imaginative prayer to come face to face with Christ. And it's really important. Uh, also, active imagination. So this is Carl Jung, and, and it's interesting. I'm not blaming Jung. I like Jung a lot. Um, but what, what ends up happening is when the church started falling apart and getting rid of stuff, well, you know, new age, scientists, psychologists, they all came in to usurp this stuff. In fact, Freud created the analytical space modeled after the the confessional, the Catholic confessional. Once we got rid of the confessional, because who needs that? You know, I go straight to God, right? A lot of people say that. Then there, the, there was a vacuum open for come to me. And then they got customers and they got patients and they were doing a non-sacramental confession, right? All the sacraments, I'm not even going into the sacraments today. Those are all very powerful tools that if not used, will be picked up and usurped. The confessional is one of them. That's what modern psychoanalysis is. But I get it. I get it. There's good reason why too, right? The church fails and then the, you know, the world picks it up. So hey, we'll do it. So active imagination though. So Carl Jung teaches this in more of a secular way, but Jung, it was a very spiritual man and he, he really appreciated the symbolism of the mass. And so he understands and would, you know, encourage religious symbolism and, and religious ritual, but he used active imagination. And so even if you're a secular person, you can, you know, use your imagination. Like, have you ever read the book, Think and Grow Rich? Uh, Napoleon Hill talks about having a mental mastermind. Mental mastermind. So he would like, you know, visual, if he had a problem, he would visualize himself there with like Dale Carnegie and Henry Ford and, you know, Vanderbilt or whoever, like these rich men that he, he um, admired. 
he would go into active imagination. That's what it was about. The, men, the mental mastermind was about active imagination with like, I think he had Abraham Lincoln in there and stuff like that too. Well, you can do that. You can do that. You can do that with Jesus. And it's even better because Jesus loves you. I don't know if Abraham Lincoln loves you. I don't even know if he's in heaven. He might be in hell. So imagine it. So let's talk for a moment. Imagination. Now, before I go into the, 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 the power of imagination and why I'm at, you can't have a really strong prayer life without mental prayer, which is what? Imagination. You have to use your imagination. I know people are like, oh, you're just imagining stuff. But I don't think you recognize, when people say that, I don't think they recognize the power of imagination. No other creature on earth can imagine. If you look at the world that we live in right now, you look out the window, if you see skyscrapers, you see cars, you see the internet right now, these all came from the imagination of man. Imagination creates the thing. Pfft. Nothing that we have or experience doesn't start in the imagination. Imagination is a godlike quality. It's a part of the human faculty that, that, that is encompassed in the image of God that we are. So don't downplay imagination. You gotta be careful with imagination too because you, you could use your imagination to destroy yourself. Imagination, we're gonna talk about imagination. But just so that I can just show you who's got my back, right? I'm just making stuff up. Uh, you can go and do your own research. I, there are plenty of resources. Just go on Amazon or, you, or Google. Uh, look up St. Teresa of Avila and her way of perfection into your castle. It's all about imaginative prayer. Uh, St. Francis de Sales, Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Alphonsus Liguri. And if you really want to go deep and go way back, there's Pseudo Dionysius, who uh, is believed to be the author of, of something called The Cloud of Unknowing. And now we're really getting into some deep mystical Christian stuff that you'll almost never hear of anywhere. But Pseudo Dionysius, Cloud of Unknowing, even Meister Eckhart. I'm really interested in studying a bit more of Meister Eckhart stuff. But this isn't, this isn't just some new age stuff. This isn't just me just making stuff up. This isn't something that, you know, this, this is real stuff. This is good stuff. This is traditional stuff. Mental prayer. Mental prayer. Mental prayer. So... Imagination. So I'm going to, when you see here in red is what I'm going to go through in terms of like the practice. In terms of imagination, I would so invite you to study how to improve your imagination. And it's crazy because all the stuff I'm talking about here is Christian stuff. It's, it's developed by the saints. It, it goes way further back than these guys of like the late middle, middle ages, you know, like Paul even in, in the Bible, says, pray without ceasing. He's talking about living prayer, imaginative prayer, right? So, but today, we have so much, so much science. There's so much science of the mind that is compatible with what I'm talking about right now. Go and look up image streaming on YouTube. Look up some videos on image streaming. What they, first of all, what science has discovered about our imagination, like, so for example, like if you, in sports psychology, they have shown, there is this conclusive evidence, studies, have shown that athletes who visualize themselves in performing the sport, and while they're visualizing, it's not just in their head, it's physical. Their heart rate goes up. They can they feel it in their body. The moves in their body. It's like it's almost actually happening, but it's all happening in their imagination. They're they're more successful out on the court or the field than an athlete who just shows up or just practices with his body. That active imagination of the athlete helps him perform. And this is, I don't have the study in front of me, but go look it up. Sports psychology, right? Active imagination creates the actual thing. So there's a lot, you can, you can go deep into a rabbit hole, but when you're using active imagination, when you're, when you're doing image streaming, what you wanna do is you wanna bring in as many of the different senses, our, our, our five senses, I think we're five senses, our five senses as possible. That means it's gotta be not just visual, but auditory, right, kinesthetic. What is it when you smell, right? What's gustatory, I don't even know what that means. Is that smell? 
So when you go into your imagination, and, I, and I'll, I'll describe what it looks like for me in a moment as I go through this. Whatever it is that you're imagining, but we're talking about having a relationship with Christ, you got to be able to see his face. You got to be able to see him in your imagination. Smell what he smells like. Feel him put his arm on your hand on your shoulder, on your head. Remember, the imagination is the seed of creation. Everything in the world is a byproduct of imagination. You are literally planting the seeds and experiencing the fruit of a real life relationship with Jesus Christ in your mind. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, that's all in your head. <laughs> Everything that's in the world became in the, he became in the head began in the head. Everything in the world began in the head. Don't downplay what's happening in your head. So what does it look like? Okay, I just admit, I just told you about image streaming. Beautiful, powerful stuff. Look into it. Here's, here's the routine that I go through. And I've learned, you know, I've, I've read a lot of books on this and there are a lot of different routines. A lot of them are elaborate and tough to sort of even digest when you're reading the language. Like Teresa of Avila, she's got a, you know, a, 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 there's a little book written about Teresa of Avila. In fact, I just bought a copy for a gift for someone I love um, called Conversations with Christ. Oh, I just gotta show you it. A little book here, Christmas gift. She won't see this video. Conversations with Christ, Conversations with Christ. Teresa of Avila, the teachings of Teresa of Avila about personal prayer. I didn't want to go get that book, but there are lots of little ones, lots of little books like that, lots of little books like that. So um, there's, there, you can find methods for this. I'll give you mine, right? So you want to go into relationship with Christ so that he can take the load, like you said. How, can, how, do, I ha how do I talk to Christ? How do I have a relationship with Christ? How can he help me? Right? Of course he can, don't get me wrong, he absolutely is a conduit of grace from God. His appearance is grace from God. He is the kingdom of God. And, but all that is, that's, that's truly faith. So, you know, when the lefties say that, they're not wrong. They're, they're just not telling you the whole story. <laughs> There's got to be some involvement. But... God, does, God gives grace to whoever he wants. He does whatever he wants, and he knows the heart. He knows your heart. He knows your path. He knows that better than anybody. Some people who he gives punishment to because he knows that's what they need. Some people he gives pure grace to because he knows that's what they need. That's out of your hands, right? So this is not about manipulating God. It's about putting yourself in a place to have a relationship so that you can, well, be, have, and do everything that God wants for you. Right? And sometimes it's not always what we want. Step one, approach the holy. Approach the holy. So make yourself a sacred space. When you walk into a cathedral, when you walk into a traditional church, you know you're in somewhere special. It's not, you know, it's not next to a Starbucks or, you know, uh, it looks like a hotel park, a uh, hotel lobby or something like that. Like, Make a sacred space for yourself, even if it's just a, a, a little altar. If you notice in, in, in Genesis, Abraham always created an altar. How many Christians watching this create an altar? Do you have an altar? Right? What, I love that word altar because what is an altar? You think of an altar as like, okay, something that, ha that has some sacred stuff on it and you approach it. But the word altar also means to change. So when you approach an altar, you literally are changing. You're changing the environment. You're changing the vibe. You're changing your mind because you approach an altar. Notice, Abraham always created an altar. And he was, he was, Abraham was the father of faith, right? That's what they call him. He's the father of all, all the faithful. What made that man unique, especially when I was learning about him, was that he dude never went anywhere without setting up an altar. Always set up an altar because he knows he's about to get down on his knees and approach the holy. So I also say kneel, because if the body is redeemed by Christ, which it is because God incarnates into a body like this, which is basically saying 
this is his special thing, this body is a special thing, then we can approach God with the body, not just the mind, and we want to get our whole self involved. You know, I'm talking about bioenergetics, which is very bodily, right? Body psychology. Well, prayer for it, you know, we're talking the whole spectrum. We're talking, yeah, it's a spiritual thing, but you got to get your body prepared for that. That's why a lot of religions, you, get, you, you see them on their knees and they put their head on the ground. Uh, genuflecting, getting up and down. A lot of the Orthodox do that. They'll go down and up, down and up, down and up. Get on your knees. And basically, that's your body. That's your body. You're putting your body in a position of humility. Down on my knees. Humble. Humble. Get on my knees. So create, approach, in order to approach the holy, there are a few other things that you can do. Icons are helpful. Those who believe you don't need anything, just the Bible, are gonna might tell you, no, you shouldn't have any of those graven images, <laughs> right? Well, you're not worshiping the image, but when you see a picture of Christ, right? And of course, there are a lot of people say he looks different ways. It really doesn't matter. Just a cross, even a cross. A cross itself is a powerful symbol, right? Just a pure, just two lines, two intersecting lines, or whatever works for you. But something that you can fix your mind on. It's helpful. It's helpful. It's not God itself. It's not going to make or break it, but it's helpful. Also, things like candles and incense, sounds like music, Gregorian chants, very low in the background. What do these things do? They, they, they help you approach the holy. They create, a, they create a sacred space for you to feel reverent, which is very important because if you're going to be act, engaging your imagination, your environment should be conducive to that. So it's just, it's just creating your environment. Step one, very simple, right? And I, I don't do most of these things except kneel. I kneel. I always kneel. When I kneel, it's then I'm on, right? Kneel. Recollection. So this is the term that a lot of the saints use. Recollection. Uh, it's to, to recollect yourself. To you know, it's like when you get down on your knees and it's just like, all right, okay, okay, let me center myself. I think that's more of a more of a newer term, right? I don't say a new age term, right? But it's a newer term. It's like, okay, well, center yourself. Center yourself, right? Center yourself, right? What you do with your hands is important too. If you're praying, we should do this, right? We should do this. Even, you know, a bodily thing like this, right? It recollects. That's a prayer. In nomine Patris et Filia Spiritui Santi. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In fact, I take my time when I do that as a part of my recollection. I didn't write it here. I have a whole recollection ritual, but it always begins with in the name of the Father. And I really, I use my active imagination. What does that mean? Well, I'm in the presence of God. He's everywhere. He knows me. He knows who I am. He knows what I need. He's my creator. In the name of the Father and the Son. The Son. I point to my solar plexus. This is the, this is the rising sun. <laughs> this is the risen sun in me. Right? The Holy Spirit, the love between the rising sun in me and God the Father, right? This is just, this is the way I recollect myself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Start with the Lord's Prayer. When you're recollecting yourself, so I go through, I go through a series of prayers. I'm not going to tell you I'm all right now. You know, it's maybe another time if you guys are interested. But when you pray the Lord's Prayer, pray it really slowly. Our Father. And think about what that means. And I like to breathe it in. Our, our Father. Who art in heaven. And I'm imagining what that means. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping my mind around what that means. Recollecting. Right? Being fully present with every single word and even breathing them. This is meditation. This is a Christian meditation at its finest, brothers. Lord's Prayer, all the way right through. And you can add other prayers that you want in there, you know, whatever. You can add more prayers. I have about five different prayers. I call in the Holy Spirit, a bunch of different things. Uh, but then I always end, and I would, I would encourage you to end with a form of the Jesus prayer. So the Jesus prayer, probably one of the oldest prayers in, in the faith. Lord Jesus Christ, 
have mercy on me. In its shortest form, that's it. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. I pray it slightly different. I use a combination of the Jesus prayer and the divine mercy prayer. You don't need to know what all that means, but what do I do? I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Because I'm going to be having a conversation with him in my imagination. And I want him to know, and I want to set myself up to know, I trust whatever you say, Jesus. I trust what you're about to reveal to me. I trust that our conversation is right and true and good and from you. Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Okay? So that's what I do. That's recollection, part two. Part three, conversation with Christ. So now you're face to face. Depending on which saint that you read, some of them will tell you, approach Christ from a scene in the Bible. You can do that. You could do that. It's very helpful. Uh, there, was, there was a time that was very helpful for me to, to be there in the scene with, with Martha and Mary. <laughs> and where uh, Mary's just like chilling at Jesus' feet and like listening to him and being in love. And Martha's running around trying to like, you know, uh, get the food together. And, you know, she's, she's the host. And uh, Martha says to Jesus, can you tell Mary to get up and help me? And Jesus is like, Martha, Martha, you're busy yourself about many important things, but Mary, she's doing the most important thing right now, which is being at the feet of Jesus. And so that for me, that's a reminder because I'm a busybody. And so I used that one for quite a while when I first started this form of mental prayer. I would get myself in that scene and I would ask Jesus, why is it that what Mary's doing is more important? I, that's how I started my mental, when I began this practice about two months ago, that was my first question. Now, what's going on here? You know, is Martha, is Martha, she's very busy. She's doing good things, right? And Jesus even said that. He asserted that. He says, you're busy yourself with many good things. They're, they're good things. But Martha, uh, but Mary, who's just chilling at my feet, she's doing the most important thing. And so for me to just, to, to create the time and the space to go into this type of a mental prayer, I needed to become more like Mary, Mare. Right. And so be physically present with Christ. Right. So that's it. So you can choose a scene from the Bible. You can you can choose a verse from the Bible. Right. And 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 approach Jesus and to ask him about it. You do whatever you want, really. Right. So a lot of them will say, you know, Jesus, uh, St. Lord, uh, Ignatius would say, uh, you know, approach him in his passion. Right. Christ on the cross. I never had the guts to do that. It's too morbid for me. <laughs> maybe I'm a sissy, but I'm like, and maybe I'm a little bit too selfish sometimes. I've done it a couple of times, but I don't like it. As I'm like, Jesus, I want to talk to you about something I'm doing. <laughs> right? He knows he loves, he loves you and I as, in our selfish ways as well. And he knows it, it's, it's growth for us, right? Um, but Christ on the cross, talking to Christ on the cross, he can reveal some powerful things to you. In fact, that's where traditionally, like my mom, like old Christian sayings be like, you know, bring it to the cross, bring it to the cross, like bring it to Christ on the cross. Christ on the cross represents sacrifice, right? So a lot of times there's something that we want, but we're not willing to sacrifice. So when we approach Christ on the cross, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, what he's doing is he's telling us, hey, stop being a bitch, <laughs> right? In the way that Christ would, right? Stop being a sissy. Toughen up. Give up your life for what I'm about to reveal to you. You think you want this. You think you want that. Well, I'm about to drop something real on you, which means what? You're going to have to die. You're going to have to sacrifice the old you. The old you is no good no more. Right? So approach him where it's most appropriate for you. A lot, these days, a lot of times, I've been approaching him in the glorious mysteries. Right? His resurrection, his ascension, the descent of the Holy Spirit. Right? And sometimes... I'll just approach him like Mary at his knees, right? And I'm just there like, you know, I put my head on his lap. And I put his hand on my head, especially when I'm like, things are going tough. He'll talk to me, right? And so, but uh, a, a few things. I didn't even really go into the, the practice here, but you, when, when, when you're going to 
when Christ shows up in your imagination, you can go through just a short series of prayers here that are called acts. Adoration, Jesus, I love you. Contrition, Jesus, forgive me for not being everything that you know I can be. Thanks, thank you for all the amazing things in my life. Supplication, now Jesus, help me out with this thing. Right? Acts, remember that. Um, listen, listen to what he's saying. Listen to what he's saying. There's some times where I'm such a talker, I just keep asking questions. And he's rapid fire. He's rapid firing for me, right? But I got. But lately, I've been spending a little more time quietly just listening. And discern. Now, a lot of people are going to be like, yo, Elliot, how do you know that this is um, from Jesus and it's not from like your ego or from a demon or it's Satan talking to you, right? Like there's, that's a legitimate concern, totally legitimate concern. You got to discern. And this is where I side with the church. I don't think Jesus is going to ask you to sin. That's, that's, that's the first litmus test. Wait, Jesus, you asking me to, to do something sinful. I don't even want to get into the different variations of something sinful. Lie, cheat, steal, you know, those are the things. He's not going to ask you to lie. He's not going to ask you to cheat. He's not going to ask you to steal, right? Be dishonest, any of those things. Not fulfilling your obligations. He's not going to ask you to be a slap dick, to be lazy, to be deceitful. He's not going to ask you to do any of those things. If he's asking you to do any of those things, now you got to be careful. That's not, that's not Jesus. Because Jesus represents your best self. Your best self. And your best self knows that whatever challenges you're facing, you're, you're where you are in order to overcome that. So that you can bear the fruit. So you can earn the fruits of overcoming that damn thing. I was going to use divorce here, right? Because, you know, that's one that like people are, oh, Jesus, hear from a lot of women. She, yeah, so-called religious women, you know. God told me I need to leave my husband. No, he didn't. <laughs> that's called your rationalization hamster, right? Jesus didn't tell you that. What he did tell you is button your lip, but you didn't want to hear that. Button your lip, humble yourself, and support your man where he is, even though things are tough, right? But anyway, I don't want to get into that. Discern. And what part of the way you can discern is, the, I love the word consolation and desolation. Consolation means console with sun. With the sun, right? If it's with the sun, meaning it's, it's light, right? It's enlightening, it's true. Or desolation, no sun, darkness. Beware, be, 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 be discerning and be honest. And don't do anything right away if you're not sure. Come to Jesus in prayer multiple days. And once you commit to this, don't stop. One of the things that one of the first things he told me when I started doing this, he's like, come to me every day. Every day come to me in some way, shape, or form. Some days I don't have any questions. Some days I don't know what to say. Some days I just come and I just say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Right? All of it. Number four, resolution. Take notes. I keep a notebook. I keep a notebook. Because Jesus is dropping gems. <laughs> right? And so after I, you know, after I speak with him, he's telling me my what I need to hear, the truth. I go and I write it down. Write it down, make plans, take actions, right? Res resolve to do what he said to do. Make a vow. I, yes, Jesus, I will do that. God wants a sacrifice. God always wanted a sacrifice. All throughout the Old Testament, he's like, yo, give me sacrifices. Give me sacrifices. Jesus being the last blood sacrifice, Jesus now is asking you to sacrifice. So, when you approach him and he tells you what to do and you don't make plans or intend to take action, that's a bad sacrifice. That's like, you know, a spotted lamb, right? It's not perfect. So resolve, even if it's something hard. One of the things Jesus told me is that you need to turn on this camera, Elliot, and just start spitting on YouTube. Don't overthink it. Don't worry about it. Don't care. Just give him everything you got. Just turn on his camp, and it was a little scary for me, even now. Like, you know, I only started this like two weeks ago. Even this video here, I'm like, yo, they're not going to get it. People are not going to like me. You know, like every day I put up a YouTube video, I get like, I lose a thousand subscribers. <laughs> but Jesus is like, I don't care. I don't care. Just do it. Just get up and be honest every day. I made a resolution. And this morning, he said, make more. Make more videos. I'm like, all right. So here I am. I resolved to do it. 
Give thanks. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Always thank. Always thank. Always thank. Always be thankful. Even if he asks you to do something that you don't want to do. Thank you, Jesus. I know that you know what's best for me. And so that's it. That's all. Christian meditation at its core. Finest. Back to your question, Insane Brain 213. Listen, your whole life revolves around you overcoming these challenges. It's a purification process for your soul. God wouldn't have given you these challenges. And part of the reason why he gives us challenges, because he's given me a heck of a lot of challenges in these past 10 years. The reason why he gives you these challenges is, is there's a multitude of them, but one of them is so that you could stop relying on yourself and come to him. You mentioned that you need initiation and you need the comfort of a woman, your mom, right? You need the initiation from your dad. This is a part of his question. And comfort from your mom. Your mom and dad ain't going to do that for you. You're a man now. Nobody's going to do that for you except for Jesus in your imagination. And that's no small thing. And once you understand that and you can go to him in that way, you transcend. You evolve. You grow in. When I say holiness, I'm not talking about you becoming a, a, a priest or a saint, although that's part of our goal is to become a saint. But you become more integrated. You start becoming integrated. And it's not an easy process. It's not just a magic word. Even what I'm saying right here, man, this is you just, just, just getting started on the journey. This might work. It might not work. It might change for you, whatever it is. But you can't lose with talking to what New Agers would call your higher self. You can't lose by talking to Christ in you. Because whatever confusion you have, Jesus, what do I do? I want a father. I want a father. You know what Jesus will tell you? He says, you have a father. Jesus, I want a mother. I want a mother. He said, you know what? Let my mother be your mother. Give her your heart. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I think he might say. But he's got a different message for you. So I think it all begins right here. Discern of what, El ask him today. Yo, is what Elliot said true? Is what Elliot's saying true? Is what Elliot is pouring through in these videos in the most, in the most recent weeks, is what he's saying true? Right? Help him, ask him to help you discern if, what, if, I'm, if Elliot's just crazy or what I'm saying is true. Even everything I'm talking about bioenergetics, because I know. And now, when, now you start opening, you start opening up to the things I'm talking about. Spirit, your body's gonna change. You might start making different decisions about what you eat, what you watch, how you use your body. Even without bioenergetics, your body might start changing. You get to integrate this new you into a vessel. Bioenergetics will help that. It'll help you confront the shadows, the cracks in your armor, sealed up. But starting from this place, starting from on high, you can't lose. You could start, I said in the beginning of the video, you should start at the body. Well, I'm a body coach. So that's what I think. And I got to where I am having this conversation with y'all because I started at the body. The, bo the body has been my savior. My body has been my savior. And it's so funny because I got, it's almost like I have the stigmata. <laughs> I don't have stigmata. But I pop both biceps and my Achilles tendon. It's almost like God nailed me to the cross. He's like, Elliot, you're going to learn your lesson through this body. And so that's why I said that. That's my prejudice. But for you, a lot of times... You got to start with what's, what's available to you. And if you grew up with a really bad family, you might be, you, you might have access to your imagination in a way that I had to train to develop. Your imagination might be strong because as you'll see in a different, le in another lesson, I'm going to teach you about character structure. You might be, I don't know, I don't know your character structure, but there's a character structure called the schizoid, the leaving type that is way up living in the clouds. And they're very good at prayer. And imagination. 
So that's it. That's all. Hope this was helpful to y'all. Until next time, done.